Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, come on by and join us here at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley with all these beautiful people here. And today we are in the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, and we are in chapter 3. A short chapter, but a very powerful chapter here as we see uh, Paul sending Timothy uh, to the Thessalonians to encourage them and also to find out uh, how they are doing. So let's go ahead and pray and get into God's word. Gracious Father, we just come before you, Lord. We want to lift, lift up this day as we begin it afresh and anew, Lord. We thank you for your mercies and grace throughout the evening, Lord, that we were able, Lord, to to be kept safe by your grace and protection. Thank you for your angels that you set around us, Lord God. And now, Lord, as we begin a new day with its own troubles and cares, Lord, we pray that you help us, Lord God, that you strengthen us, Lord, to walk with you humbly and justly before our precious God. Challenge us, Lord, with situations and trials and struggles, Lord. Yes, Lord. And help us, Lord, to make good decisions, Father. We need your Holy Spirit, Lord, and your power in order to do so, Lord. And thank you for your forgiveness as we confess our, fit, our sins and faults before you, Lord. Wash us and cleanse us by the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that we are all justified, just as though we've never sinned because of that blood of Jesus that was shed upon that cross. And so you view us, Lord, as you view your Son. We're accepted, Lord, and that is not diminished whatsoever by anything, Lord God. As Paul said in Romans chapter 8, there's, there is no height, no depth, no power, no principality of the air, no, no, no work at all that can ever separate us from the love of God. Nothing at all, Lord. Your love is the same yesterday, today, as it is tomorrow for us, Lord. It's never diminished, Father, and we thank you for your love and your faithfulness, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, again, good morning. Good morning, Christina. Glad you could join us. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. So let's continue, continue on. As If you remember from uh, Monday, Paul was talking about Satan trying to hinder him, right? Yes. Being attacked from Satan. And later on, Paul will, will talk about Satan giving him a thorn in the flesh, you know, to kind of buffer him. And, and God meant it or allowed it so that it would keep Paul humble and seeking God before his feet. Um, I don't know if you've ever considered your, your pain and your suffering as a buffer, as something that keeps you at the feet of Jesus, but there's a good reason to believe that, that if it keeps you at the foot of Jesus, then it's a good thing that maybe you are in chronic pain or you're in the situation that you are in because you're seeking him uh, instead of being well, healthy, with no issues, then there's no reason really to pray to Jesus or ask him for help because you think you're okay and everything's hunky-dory and there's no reason at all to be sitting at his feet. So Paul understood that, that God's grace is sufficient and that he needs to be at the feet of Jesus all the time. Now, Satan, uh, who is an enemy of, of the Christian church, an enemy of God, uh, Isaiah talks about Satan and how Satan is accuser, a liar of the brethren, and how he wants to be like God. He wants to replace God in your life. In fact, there's a situation in Isaiah 14, I believe it is, chapter 14, where he talks to God and says, Look, I will sit on the throne, on the throne most high God. I will be God. So he's pretty much challenging God, and he has been ever since, that the Lord cast him down and a third of the angels to this earth. And so he's our arch enemy. Peter describes him as a roaring lion seeking to devour uh, Christians. Of course, we, of course, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we can know his, his plans and his schemes for our lives. And we don't need to allow him to uh, buffer us without uh, understanding that God is in control. So he's still thinking about this, this buffering, uh, the enemy challenging him causing havoc in his life, hindering his move. And so he goes to chapter 3. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. So notice that Paul didn't give up. 
The enemy is attacking. The enemy is hindering. Uh, and he will always do that. And Paul said, okay, so we're going to change our plans a little bit. We're going to adjust here. We're going to stay in Athens. But we're still going to pursue uh, our relationship with the Thessalonians. I'm going to send Timothy out there. And we're going to find out what's going on out there in their faith and love. And he's also going to encourage you concerning uh, and establish you concerning your faith. And so Paul didn't stop. He didn't let anything stop him. Uh, that's tenacity, right? To persevere, right? No matter what the odds are. Uh, just the other day, someone uh, made a compliment that we were talking to someone and they, they said, uh, you know, uh, the pastor has uh, been doing this for a long time and nothing stops him. He's, he's, he's determined to see this through. You know, and as a pastor, um, there have been many times where I could have threw in the towel, you know? I don't know if you've ever seen boxing. You probably have. But there's some boxing matches where you're watching the opponent just beat up the other guy. And, and you're just wondering, when is the referee going to stop this fight? When, when is his corner going to get the white towel and throw it in there and say, that's enough, you know? But he, they just keep doing it and doing and doing it. There used to be this boxer in the old days. I'm talking in the 70s. I can't remember his name at this moment, but they used to call him the human punching bag. That's how he would box. He would just let people beat him up, but he would win because he didn't really protect himself. He just went after them. And his face looked like it got beat up pretty bad. Um, but you wonder, when are they gonna throw in the towel? When are they gonna throw in the towel? No, they don't throw in the towel as quickly. Uh, they need to persevere through as that one boxer I shared. So throwing in a towel is not an option, but yet we see today um, a thousand, churches closing every month mm. you know it's amazing how many churches close now how many churches are really works of the flesh i don't know how many are really works of god i don't know but we know statistically that churches are closing down every day you know they're throwing in the towel they're moving i know of pastors who will close down their church to move to another church because they're using it as a stepping stone to a bigger church and ultimately they'll have a huge church that way you know to me that's a harley that's not a calling You've, you've found a job and you're just climbing the ladder as per se in, in your denomination. But how about staying in one place for 25 years? How about persevering through all the struggles and pains? How, how about being able to relate to all the struggles you see in the Bible, you know, from enemies, from, from people so close to you and so related to you or people that come in and say they love you, but then they, they stab you in the back and so forth. How about those things? You know, Paul didn't stop. Now, he thought it's better for us if we stay here in Athens and I'll send Timothy there to encourage and strengthen you. So his heart was still, still again, to encourage and strengthen. Now, as you know, we saw last week that the Thessalonians were worried about uh, the return of Christ and they felt that maybe they missed it. And so you can only imagine all the, the talking that was going on. Well, well, maybe we missed it. Maybe it's not true. Uh, maybe this Jesus didn't resurrect from it. And the, it brings in doubt, right? And concerns and worries. So Paul has to deal with those, those issues. And he sends Timothy in there, which can always be difficult because confrontation and dealing with issues of faith and growth you know, can be difficult. The faith, one thing, this is what the Bible says. This is what we need to believe. This is how we should live our lives. But encouragement to do right, that's another thing because people don't want to be encouraged to do right. They want to do right, but they don't want someone encouraging them to do right because they're ashamed. They feel they feel pointed out. They feel like I should learn this on my own. Uh, they, they don't want to be, you know, pulled out of the group. And so there's a lot that goes with it. So it's very difficult. But Paul said, we're going to do it anyway. We're going to encourage their faith, and we're going to establish uh, them in the faith. And so that's a good thing. It says that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. What afflictions? From the enemy. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. So Paul looked at this more than just um, my job. He looked at it as this is what God has called me to do. And that's what God has called the leadership to do, an apostle he has a great responsibility. A pastor has a great responsibility. He is called to tend the sheep. A shepherd doesn't bring a flock out to the field and then walk away and say, take care of yourselves, see you later. You know, no, he's there watching because there are wolves that are coming in. There are sheep that are being led astray. I don't know if you know this. Uh, a shepherd's look at Psalms 23, great little book. It's a great little read. If you have an opportunity, read it. But it talks about shepherds and their responsibility and how they, they shepherd the flock. 
because <clears throat> a sheep literally will stray, and if it walks off the cliff, the other ones will follow along. They don't mm. even think about it. They just walk over and over, next and next. And <laughs> you see this pile of sheep, you're like, what are you guys thinking? I don't know. We saw him do it. Let's do it. You know, and they just kind of follow along with him. And you have people like that. You know, you have people that are troublemakers, and if they cause trouble, others just kind of follow along, follow along. Why are you doing this? I don't know. They said this, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, we had a young man do that here, spreading a bunch of rumors and gossip, and everybody just followed him. And I remember having a meeting trying to resolve it, you know, and all this young man was saying I was embezzling money, but all the reports showed that it was an embezzlement. He just didn't know how to read a report. It was an expense. It was an expense account. And uh, because no expense was inquired in that quarter, there was a zero there. And he kept thinking there should be a dollar sign there of some sort. And I go, no, that's an expense. But where's the money? It's still in the income. <laughs> it's still in the account. It hasn't been used. He couldn't understand that because he's naive to accounting and finances. Well, he's telling everybody that I was embezzling. So we had this meeting to try to talk through this and give them the evidence. But all they were doing was, you took money. Where's our money? We want it back. And it's like, it's not your money. Money. It's God's money, first of all. And, and you don't give God money and then take it back. You trust God that you're giving that money to him and that God will hold those responsible for that. So, so this guy just led them astray and they just all follow along like sheep, you know. And he's supposed to be a leader. You know, he's supposed to be a leader. So that happens and sheep do that. You know, sheep will, will be devoured by wolves. They'll come in. And so that shepherd needs to beat up that wolf. When someone comes in, that shepherd needs to take care of of those wolves and that has happened here in this church also where people have come and tried to spread rumors on Calvinism or other doctrines, faith doctrine. We had a couple here years and years ago that were from the faith movement and they really believed in their, in their giving. They outgave the whole church. That's how much they gave. And they had visions of this becoming a university a teaching school. And I'm like, I don't know where we're going to put a university on this property, but okay. But they had these grandeur ideas because they were part of the faith movement, which says that if you just believe it, God's going to give it to you. Uh, but it was a struggle because they were trying to get everybody, you need to tithe 10%. If you're not tithing, God's not going to, you know, they're going around telling everybody this instead of letting it be done by the Holy Spirit. And then I had to confront them finally, you know, and of course they left. You know, so I've had those issues. Another issue is when sheep just want to do their own thing. You know that a shepherd will literally take a young sheep and he will literally break their legs. He'll break the legs of that young sheep and then he'll put the sheep on his shoulders until they mend and then let him go. Now, why does he do that? That's cruel. That's mean. Well, but it causes the sheep to hear his voice because as he's leading and guiding and convert, conversing with others, the sheep is right there to hear his voice and he gets to know his voice. He's broken. He can't do much, but he's there at the shepherd's shoulders and the shepherd is holding him, you know, every step of the way, loving him, nurturing him. And then when he's let go, he knows the shepherd's voice and he doesn't stray away again. And that's a technique that God uses oftentimes where he breaks us so that we sit at his feet as we were talking earlier. So, so God, it's difficult to correct these issues, but yet it's not a job. It is a calling. If you love the sheep, you're going to correct those sheep uh, through those situations. And so he says in verse five, uh, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent uh, to know your faith, at least by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. So again, the reason is because the devil's out there like a roaring lion and he wants to, to devour us completely. You know, we must, we must know the enemy's tactics. There's a good book uh, called Strategies of Satan. It's a small little book, a, a good read, but if you ever get the opportunity, purchase it, Strategies of Satan. You can probably get it from Amazon or one of those places, and it tells you the strategies. It's, he wrote a very good book on how Satan works and how he has been working from day one. And so you get to know his strategies. Now, when you read that book, be careful because the enemy doesn't like it that you're going to know how he works, <laughs> and so he's going to try to stop you from reading that. But if you want to be victorious and strong in the Lord, that's a good book to start with. He goes on as he receives an encouraging uh, report from Timothy. It says, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, Brethren, in all affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith.
faith. Um, it's always good when God sees his children working together, loving, truly. What does he say? Faith and what? Love. Those two components together. Because love and faith work together. Uh, we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? Um, the love chapter, we call it, right? Yes. Um, and it takes faith to live like that, that we don't keep record of wrong, that we truly love one another. We're not rude. We're not envious. We're not prideful. All of these things, which is an example of faith. And Paul is saying, look, your faith and your love for one another is exceptional. It's exceptional. And, and I am blessed by it. And it's always a blessing to see a church functioning and working together. I, I remember hearing a pastor say that they don't have gossip in their church, not one gossip. No one has ever left or been divided because of the gossip. And I thought to myself, how is that even possible? How is that even possible? And he said this, the reason that we have no gossip is because as soon as one person gossips, we ask them to leave. We will not talk. We have zero tolerance of that. Zero tolerance. So, hey, and the Lord bless that because the Lord will bring faithful people that won't be gossipers, you know, at all. And so I thought, wow, so discipline is important in the church and correction is important. But to have a church, no gospels, a church that doesn't complain, how do you do that? The children of Israel complained, you know, as soon as they complain, you know, either you kick them out or you correct them as quickly as you can. Or you teach them how to not be complainers, which, by the way, we're going to we're going to be looking at tonight. The children of Israel complaining because they're hungry and God hasn't given them any food, so God's giving them manna and meat, and yet they're still complaining. And we're going to see how we can stop complaining. So he goes on, uh, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, uh, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. So again, some encouragement here in chapter 3. Uh, he's praying to God the Father that the Lord would strengthen them and they would be even more abounding in love. Well, wait a minute. Once we love, isn't that enough? No, there's more, more of love. We're, we're, so, we're so sinful. It's so in, ingrained in our every fiber that you can never love enough. You can never love enough. And so we need to strive to love even more and more here, as he says, that God may establish our hearts blameless in holiness, holiness before our God, the Father. And then notice what he says at the end. And the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. Now, is he talking about the rapture there? No. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. Now, there are two comings, and I'll end with this. Uh, because he's going to get into it in chapter 4, in chapter 5, um, as he's talking about the rapture of the church, which the early church did teach, by the way. There's some that don't believe in the rapture because the word rapture is not used in the Bible. The literal word rapture is not used. Well, neither is the word trinity used in the Bible, yet we believe in the trinity. So that logic uh, doesn't work. Uh, the word caught up is used, which is a Latin word uh, where we get the word rapturus or, or raptured in the air. So it is uh, the language that defines the word of the meaning. So that's why we use rapture or caught up in the air. And he's going to talk about that. But this is the second coming. So we have two events that are coming in the future. The, f the first event is the rapture, which we'll see again next week or Friday. So what is the rapture? The rapture is when Jesus will be coming with those who are with him, but he's not coming to the earth. He's coming in the sky. And the Bible says a trumpet will sound, the, the angels will be trumpeting, and the and a voice will be sounded, and we'll hear it, and we will be raptured out of this earth into the presence of Jesus with our new body. So if it happens now, this body will transform to a new body, and the soul will stay in it and will be raptured up. Those who are dead, their souls are with Christ. And those who are dead and buried in the ground, wherever it is, God is going to put them all together and they're going to meet their body in the air. That's the rapture. The second coming is later on, and we see that in Revelation, where God will come back and he'll be riding with his saints, coming to the earth to do battle against this enemy. And the reason that he mentions it is twofold. One, 
is that the enemy is going to be destroyed that's been giving them this havoc and attacking them. So God will take care of him eventually, so we need to believe that. You know, someone once said, look, when the enemy bugs you and he reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Amen. You know, hey, I know my past. That's why Jesus died on the cross for me. But you know what your future? You're going to be thrown into the pit for eternity, so you better back off in Jesus' name. So remind him of his future. Now, the second reason that he's mentioning it here is because he's trying to encourage them. That I know that you're feeling like God hasn't returned yet, and he hasn't, but he's going to. Not on our timing, not on your timing, or when you think he should, but on his timing. So he's still coming. We just have to be patient. We have to be waiting for the Lord to make that decision on when he will return. And when he returns, he will return for you. So what is he doing? He is encouraging them, right? Trying to get them to understand, look, your doubts and, and concerns are not founded. Uh, they're not founded on a good foundation. Uh, just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it ain't going to happen, you know. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen on God's timing. And a lot of things happen on God's timing. His rapture and second coming will happen on his timing. His second return, tribulation, those are all future things that are going to happen. If you go back to the Old Testament, there are a lot of things that they spoke about, the coming Messiah that would happen. It didn't happen for a long time. Abraham, he never saw the blessings, right? God said, you're going to be a father of great nations. Did he see these great nations? No, he passed away before it even happened, before Jacob could even see it. He had passed away. And it wasn't until Moses came in that all of a sudden the 12 sons grew into this great nation uh, of theirs. And now they're going into the promised land to take it over and run into a lot of problems and then end up being captive to Babylon, dispersed throughout the world. Some of them in Rome, some of them were there rebuilding the temple through Herod, who was half Jew, and established there. But then God scatters them again in the world, and today they're scattered, but they're returning to Israel, which became a nation back in 1948-52 when it was finalized uh, because of the German war and what they were doing to the Jews and annihilating them. And so all the other countries felt sorry for the Jews and said, yes, let them go back to the land and create their own nation, which has never happened in the history of the world. So God has a way of working things out, even though they haven't worked out yet. And the Old Testament Jews, they looked at those things as though they were coming, but they never came, but they still believed by faith. And for us today, we have to do the same thing. We have to believe that God is going to save us, even in our little trials and struggles. Okay, God, you promised what? Romans eight twenty eight, right? He promised to what? All things. Work all things out for good. That's a promise. That is a promise. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to work out according to Reuben's way. <laughs> you know, it's going to work out according to his good. So you have to believe that in your heart. You have to believe that God's going to work all the things out in your life for good. Something good's going to come out of this. There's going to be fruit. And you may not see it right now. You might not see it later on. But you have to believe that he's working it out for good and trust in him. That's what faith is. And that's what Paul was commending them on. You have faith in God. Not faith in yourself, but in God, because he is the one that answers prayer. So they needed to look to the future, and he's reminding and encouraging them, it's still coming. Hasn't changed. God's plan hasn't changed at all. He hasn't changed at all. And he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so if he's promised you something, then believe it, that he is going to fulfill it. You need to put your faith and trust in him completely. So that's what Paul is doing here. And then he's going to get more into it as we go to chapter 4, as he uh, gives us direction on growth and talk about the, the rapture of the church, which we'll get into a little bit more. So praise God. Uh, no cameras falling to the, to the floor. <laughs> no disruptions. The enemy has been pushed down and away from this study. So thank God. God bless you guys. Thank you for, for viewing our Devo this morning. Please uh, share this on your wall or do a watch party afterwards or any time of any of our Devos. And you can go to YouTube and look up Calvary Chapel Inland. And you can see all our Devos there from 2017, 18, and this year if you ever want to go back and reference a, a book and get a half an hour teaching on a chapter, you can do that without any problem. Or go to our website, uh, ccinland.org and you can also do the same thing on their media and look up the various teachings even our Sunday mornings and Wednesday evening teachings are on there 
So a great way to grow in the Lord. God bless you. We love you. We pray that God will strengthen your faith and your love for one another. Have a wonderful day.